Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can provide a comprehensive review of paranoid personality disorder. So I'll be taking a look at not only the definition, but the history, etiology, comorbidity, and treatment. I'll refer to paranoid personality disorder as PPD. Now, PPD features a pervasive pattern of distrust, suspiciousness, and hostility, and it's an under-researched disorder. Some have even suggested that it should be removed from the DSM. PPD is in cluster A. It's a cluster A personality disorder, so it's in the same cluster as schizoid and schizotypal personality disorders. This is the odd eccentric cluster. Now, in terms of the history of PPD, we see that it has been in every edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM, including the first DSM, DSM-1, published in 1952. Schizotypal personality disorder was introduced in DSM-3, and after this, PPD was one of the least researched disorders, right, because there's some overlap between PPD and schizotypal, and a lot more research interest in schizotypal, we see that PPD has kind of been pushed to the side. Now, the conceptualization of schizotypal isn't the only reason that PPD has not been researched that much. We also see that there's this tendency of individuals with the disorder to not seek out treatment, which of course makes sense considering one of the key features of the disorder is distrust. Another reason is that paranoia is found in a number of other disorders, although it's not always listed as an official diagnostic criterion. Paranoia in one form or another is present in many presentations of post-traumatic stress disorder, borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, and schizophrenia. So when a clinician is presented with a client who appears to have paranoia, that clinician is going to be fairly likely to assign a diagnosis other than paranoid personality disorder. Now I mentioned that paranoid personality disorder was in cluster A. Interestingly, cluster A personality disorders are often thought of as more severe than other personality disorders, although I would largely disagree with that generalization. I would say a fairly good argument could be made that cluster A and cluster B personality disorders are about equal in terms of severity. Cluster B personality pathology contains four disorders, antisocial, borderline narcissistic, and histrionic personality disorders. I think that one reason that Cluster A personality disorders are sometimes thought of as more severe is because they are highly resistant to treatment, whereas many individuals with Cluster B personality disorders can improve somewhat, and sometimes people can improve quite a bit with those disorders. Improvement would be considered less likely when talking about Cluster A personality disorders. Also, the Cluster A personality disorders are thought of as being on a continuum with schizophrenia. This would also contribute to this idea that cluster A personality pathology must be more severe. Now, specifically looking at paranoid personality disorder again, we see that its prevalence is about 2 to 4% in the general population, but only about 0.7% of the population has PPD and no other comorbid disorders. So paranoid personality disorder is highly comorbid with other mental disorders, and I'll talk about that in a few moments. So looking at the definition of this disorder, as we see it in the DSM, we see that paranoid personality disorder has seven symptom criteria. Four or more are required for a diagnosis. Symptom number one, the individual believes that others are deceiving, exploiting, or harming them, and the evidence doesn't support this belief. So if someone is out to get another individual, that individual wouldn't necessarily meet the symptom criterion. If the evidence supports it, that would be different than what we see here in this criterion. Moving to symptom number two, this is a preoccupation with unjustified doubts about the loyalty of friends or colleagues. So essentially, somebody with this disorder distrusts everyone. Symptom number three, the individual is reluctant to confide in others. They're fearful that that information will be used against them. So we see low straightforwardness, only saying the minimum necessary to accomplish the goal of any given social interaction. Symptom number four interprets benign remarks as demeaning or threatening. And I've even seen this extend to remarks that are extremely benign. For example, something like, how are you? That can even seem threatening. 
the person with the disorder might be thinking, why does this person want to know how I am, right? So they're reading in to everything. Symptom number five, persistently bears grudges. So with paranoid personality disorder, the list of enemies just keeps growing, the list of enemies that they make. So they have an unforgiving attitude. Symptom number six, they believe that their character or reputation is being attacked and they quickly react with anger. So we see a significant hostility component with this disorder. And what happens is people just start avoiding the individual who has the disorder because of all this anger and hostility. Moving to the last symptom criterion, number seven, the individual believes their spouse or partner is being unfaithful. And this is without justification. So really similar to that first symptom criterion, except the distrusted person is a love interest. And this is extremely common when working with somebody who's paranoid, regardless of whether it's part of paranoid personality disorder or another disorder. Now, a diagnosis of PPD cannot be given if the symptoms occur exclusively in the course of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder with psychotic features, or any psychotic disorder. So what this means is that technically, PPD can be comorbid with schizophrenia, but many clinicians won't diagnose both PPD and schizophrenia. It's going to be one or the other in many cases. Some individuals with PPD also have brief psychosis. Now, it's not prolonged psychosis like we'd expect to see with schizophrenia, but this does make this disorder very difficult to differentiate from schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. Now, the thoughts, feelings, attitudes, and behaviors associated with PPD are often congruent with the individual's inner experience. This is called being egocentric. So for the individual with PPD, their paranoia seems normal, appropriate, and justified. They don't believe that they have a mental disorder. So this makes this disorder quite similar to the cluster B personality disorders, but a little bit different than what we see with a couple of the cluster C personality disorders, specifically avoidant and dependent. Those disorders can be egocentric, but often they're egodystonic. The individual who has avoidant or dependent personality disorder realizes that something's not quite right. They realize that they are distressed and that it's a disorder that's causing it, right? So with OCPD, with obsessive compulsive personality disorder, that's the remaining cluster C personality disorder, sometimes we see an egocentric nature and sometimes egodystonic, but I think most of the time with that disorder, it's more on the egocentric side. Now, in terms of some other characteristics related to PPD, we see a strong sense of autonomy. Individuals with this disorder are very independent. They tend to be sensitive to criticism. This overlaps with narcissistic personality disorder, NPD. They tend to be litigious, and there's a few different reasons for this. One would be hostility. Another would be seeking revenge. And the third one would be finding the truth. So sometimes if somebody believes somebody's out to get them, filing a lawsuit may be the only way to find out if that's really the case. So they're trying to kind of dig into a situation and discover this person's ill intent toward them. And again, sometimes the law is the only avenue for them to find that out. Now, this also overlaps with NPD, and so do the unrealistic grandiose fantasies that we tend to see with paranoid personality disorder. Now, with PPD, there's an emphasis on power and rank, not the ideal love fantasies that we tend to see with NPD. But either way, we see a significant overlap here between paranoid and narcissistic personality disorders. Individuals with paranoid personality disorder often appear to be cold, sarcastic, uncompromising, stubborn, argumentative, defensive, and hostile. And because they're hostile and some of these other things, that elicits a hostile response from other people. So we see kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. They are angry and aggressive with others, and then people return those feelings to them. And then the individual with PPD says, I knew it. I knew this person was out to get me all along, right? So that's what we see. This cycle just kind of repeats. Typically, individuals with this disorder are also not good at collaborating, but they do sometimes get along with other people who are paranoid. This, of course, is more likely to happen if the individual with the disorder has something in common in terms of their beliefs with another person who's paranoid, like they believe in the same conspiracy theory, for example. Now, in terms of etiology, in terms of what causes PPD, we know that negative childhood experiences are tied 
to this disorder. Specifically, early body contact trauma has a strong association with the development of paranoid personality disorder. In terms of heritability, we see it's actually relatively low for PPD as compared to other personality disorders, somewhere between 21 and 28% heritability. Now, in terms of comorbidity, we know that paranoid personality disorder has a lot of comorbidity. It tends to co-occur with a number of other mental disorders. 75% of people with PPD have a comorbid personality disorder. Common comorbid personality disorder pathology includes schizoid, schizotypal, this isn't surprising, they're both in cluster A, but also narcissistic, borderline, and avoidant. Now, interestingly, among these personality disorders that are comorbid, the most common comorbidity would actually be with borderline and avoidant personality disorders. Other comorbidity with PPD includes panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, substance use disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, in comparing PPD to schizoid and schizotypal, we see that PPD is not as strongly associated with social deficits and odd behaviors. Although certainly from an outside observer's point of view, the disorder can seem to have those features. It's also associated with cognitive impairment. So all the cluster A personality disorders have this cognitive impairment component. But with PPD, it's not considered as severe as with the other cluster A personality disorders. So PPD is difficult to differentiate from schizoid and schizotypal personality disorders and, of course, it's difficult to differentiate from schizophrenia. This has created a particular problem in terms of accurate diagnosing. The prodromal phase of schizophrenia is difficult to distinguish from really all of the cluster A personality disorders. So the prodromal phase is the phase right before the onset of schizophrenia. Now, again, schizoid and schizotypal would be a little bit more difficult to differentiate, but PPD is still difficult to separate, especially from this prodromal phase of schizophrenia. So looking at schizotypal for a moment, we see that about 30% of individuals with schizotypal personality disorder will eventually develop a psychotic disorder, with schizophrenia being the most common outcome when a psychotic disorder develops. PPD is also a risk factor, but it's not considered to be as pronounced a risk factor as schizotypal is. An important note here, though, 40% of individuals with PPD have comorbid schizotypal personality disorder. Now to look at the personality characteristics associated with PPD. When I'm looking at personality theory, I usually use the five-factor model. I remember the five traits through the acronym OCEAN, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So looking at PPD in terms of the five-factor model, we see a weak negative correlation with openness to experience. We see no association with conscientiousness. With extroversion, we see a split here in terms of the facets. So PPD is positively correlated with excitement seeking, but negatively correlated with positive emotions, warmth, and gregariousness. PPD is negatively correlated with all of the facets of agreeableness, and the one that really stands out, of course, is trust, right? So as PPD increases, we see trust decreases. And in terms of the last trait, PPD is positively correlated to all of the facets of neuroticism, and angry hostility is the most pronounced here. Now moving to treatment, PPD is generally considered to be treatment resistant. There have only been a few studies that look at treatments that may yield positive results for somebody with a disorder. Skills training is one of those areas that has been suggested as potentially beneficial to individuals with PPD, and cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, may be promising too. Now, another reason that treatment isn't often successful with PPD is that misdiagnosing is common. Clinicians tend to jump to a diagnosis like schizophrenia or other disorders that have a psychotic component, right? So often this disorder is misdiagnosed and therefore the correct treatment cannot be delivered. So PPD is an interesting diagnosis. One of the questions I hear sometimes with this disorder is, does this diagnostic category matter? Is this an important disorder to have in the DSM? And I think the answer is yes, because PPD is associated with devastating outcomes, a lot of social outcomes, but also work outcomes. Often when people have had PPD for a while, they find it difficult to maintain employment. Paranoid personality disorder makes other disorders more hazardous. So here I'm talking about comorbidity. So more hazardous to the person with the disorder, but also to others. 
right? People are exposed to the symptoms that the individual with PPD has. This is similar to substance use disorder. If somebody has a mental disorder and they have comorbid substance use disorder, often the symptoms are going to be worse because of those substances. With PPD, we see, again, it's often comorbid with disorders like narcissistic personality disorder. So the individual is going to be even more vindictive, antisocial personality disorder. They're going to have more motivation to do harm with the PPD added on. Borderline personality disorder, they're going to have a worse devaluation phase. So when they devalue a love interest, they're going to be even more angry and hostile to that person. And with borderline, of course, we already see that anger and paranoia are part of that disorder. So again, adding on PPD just makes those symptoms worse. PPD also worsens the outcomes for a number of other disorders like anxiety disorders and depressive disorders. So we see with PPD that prognosis is generally poor. Individuals with this disorder often end up isolated. They don't trust people and other people don't tend to trust them. But this doesn't mean that we should give up hope for treating this disorder. I've seen some occasions where this disorder responds relatively well to treatment. Again, it's treatment resistant. That doesn't mean that treatment is impossible. So if somebody has PPD, seeking counseling treatment is still a good option. Now, I know whenever I talk about personality disorders, like paranoid personality disorder, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.